You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors, All right, everybody. That music means we are back in action once again. It is Education Wednesday. It is time to get our learning on. It is time for Options Boot Camp, the premier options educational program. My name, of course, Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com. It's the only one. And, of course, the Options Insider Radio Network as well. I want to thank all of you out there who are tuning in with us this week. Remember, if you do like what you hear, do keep rating and reviewing out there on your platform of choice. Really does help all the new folks continue to discover the content out there. And of course, if you want to go above and beyond, you want more content in your life, you have more questions, you want to get access to our awesome, our pretty much unrivaled, nothing else like it in the business, pro Q&A sessions. I've never seen such a, an extensive roster of great guests coming in just to answer your questions. How nice are we? We put all their feet to the fires. They come in, answer their questions, and they do it. So it's awesome. So check it out. If you're not taking advantage of it, you are quite foolish, as well as, of course, options oddities every week. The live streams we put out here throughout the week, you get the giveaways, all sorts of fun, early access to shows like this. If you're not going to be able to make it live, we put it up on the pro podcast feed as a bit of an exclusive. So all sorts of fun, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go to begin that journey to the dark side. And you know what? While you're going to the dark side, you might as well go all the way. You might as well check out the black-hatted one himself, Mr. Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring. Mr. P, how go things on the dark side, sir? Hey, buongiorno, my friend. How are you? I'm doing great over here. It's, uh, It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. And it's a beautiful day to answer some questions. So let's get to it. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All right, everybody. That music means it is time to unleash the mail call beast. See what you folks have in store for us this week. Before we do that, Mr. P, the folks have been waiting patiently. They've been waiting an entire extra week just to hear their words of wisdom from the only black-headed one himself. So, Dan, let's kick it off the way we are wont to do What is the Dan Passarelli? What is the MTM question of the week? (laughs) So, you know what? I was actually thinking about this one. I don't, nobody actually even asked me this question, but I'm, I'm going to pose it anyway. Well, then it doesn't count, does it? It's (laughs) fake. (laughs) That's right. If a question falls in the forest, wait, hold on a second. Uh, No. So uh, pretty funny story on the last episode. I, I mentioned as sort of our, 
question of the week, I think, about um, directional butterflies and how powerful they can be. And there was a while back, this was, oh man, it's probably seven years ago or something, but I, uh, you know, I used to get invited by this brokerage firm to give presentations. And somehow this other guy who was one of those people that uh, Mark was talking about on the last show who, you know, uh, some of these unsavory expos will, you know, let anybody in who pays them. And he, he was kind of one of those guys, like this person, why is this person teaching, pretending to be an option teacher? And uh, it was funny, the, 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 he somehow finagled his way to giving presentations for this brokerage firm. I was talking to the guy over there and I was like, who, do you know who this guy is? Like, yeah, yeah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And he put out this trade that was a directional, condor or iron condor one or the other and i was like this is the dumbest trade that i ever saw and and it actually was a completely dumb trade uh that said that said i've been doing a lot of work with wing spreads lately and strangely i noticed that a lot of professional traders will actually trade not a lot, but sometimes we'll actually trade directional condors. Now, it doesn't make this other guy's trade good for many reasons. It was just a crazy, dumb trade. But every once in a while, <clears throat> you can get away, uh, well, not get away with, but you can cr model out a directional condor that makes tons of sense and has extremely great risk reward. And, um, you know, because I was talking about directional butterflies before, I, I figured I'd throw that one on your radar as well. Um, probably you'll model it out 10 times and it won't make sense. You won't trade it. But there'll be that one time where you're like, wow, holy cow, I get this tiny risk, this big reward and this big, you know, area that the stock can be in for me to hit max profit. Okay. So, you know, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before, always model out three different ways to trade an opportunity and pick the one that seems to make the most sense. So a directional condor, give us an example of that. Is that you talking maybe just moving one of the legs a little bit farther out? <laughs> yeah. So, well, you know, not like, not like broken wing, um, but you know, like say you're looking at, uh, well, Wells Fargo here, I got pulled up on my screen. I, this is not a good candidate for that. Uh, I actually bought a, I, I own straddles in there. I think straddles are probably make a lot more sense, but you're Mr. You know, straddle these days. <laughs> I, I, I am, man. Uh, I mean, it just doesn't make sense where the VIX is. It just doesn't make sense. And I'm not a big fundamental guy and you know, I'm wrong as much as a lot of, as much as a lot of people when I'm trying to figure out what's going on in the market, as opposed to just trading the numbers or the charts. But why would this mark? Why would the VIX be at 20 and a half right now? Uh, it should be way higher. But anyway, you know, like, okay, so Wells Fargo's at 38 and change. You know, maybe you think it's going to bounce back and retrace because uh, Jerome Powell is going to save the world, uh, you know, doing whatever it is he does. Um, and, you know, you know, you think, okay, I don't know how far it'll go up. Maybe it'll go up to 40, 44. Maybe it'll go up to 48. I don't know. Like, it may be the case where you could buy like, you know, the 41 calls, sell the 42 calls, sell the 46 calls and buy the 47 calls. Now, I'm not even looking at an option chain. The prices might be ridiculous, but just the concept there where, all, you know, you would, do, you would not do an iron, you would do a regular condor because you want all the calls to be out of the money. But, you know, then the advantage there is, is you're getting all this protection. You're probably, because all the calls are out of the money, you're probably picking this up for really, really cheap with a really, really good risk reward. Uh, there's a bit of art and science to it, some nuance to it. But I don't know, you know, I, I'm thinking if you've watched enough of our shows, you, you, you're probably doing okay with your trading. You probably know enough to you know, to, to at least model some stuff out and see what makes sense. So, you know, take a look at that sometimes when you're looking for a directional trade, um, especially one where you're not super certain, you don't have a great target in mind, you want to risk just a tiny bit and still be able to make a lot. 
um, check it out. It might end up making sense for you. Interesting stuff. I have to do a, an episode on that one of these days. What do you say? Yeah, yeah. I see. I see it being traded. Uh, you know, I uh, you know, I'll let the heck cat out of the bag. I'm going to announce this to everybody next week. But uh, I created a wing spread scanner and, and that scans for professional traders wing spreads, and I see them pop up now and then. I see these directional uh, condors, and I'm like, boy, I never would have thought that this makes sense. But a people professionals are doing it and b when i look at it i'm like yeah this actually does make sense if you're interested listeners let us know maybe we'll make that the focus of an upcoming episode now let's make you folks the focus uh first off let's pay off what you folks have been weighing in on already uh, last week we asked you a couple of questions on the show we had a fun one actually this was earlier this week on our crypto rundown show we were discussing crypto just rallying like crazy of late and we were only half jokingly saying is crypto really the new flight to quality asset so we put that out to you folks during the show, a little bit of a flash poll. And we said, quite simply, crypto, particularly Bitcoin and ETH, is it the new flight to quality asset? And it was more contentious in the voting than I thought. It ended up, no, just slightly taking it, Dan. 53.3% saying no. 46.7% saying yes. So nearly half of the audience saying crypto is now a flight to quality asset, sir. What say you? Oh, boy. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, you know... I, I read a lot of stuff and I've been reading uh, uh, how to, I think it's called How to Deal with the Changing World Order by Ray Dalio, uh, which is, you know, it's an interesting one. Uh, it's a little um, apocalyptic almost. Uh, he doesn't paint a good picture for the future. Um, and so, I mean, I don't know. I just look at the things that uh, are going on in the world here. And if the, uh, if the zombie apocalypse comes, <laughs> you know, um, what the heck are you going to do with a computer, let alone crypto, you know? Um, so I don't, I don't see that as a real flight to quality, uh, for whatever reason, gold always has been, uh, I don't know what you do with gold in a zombie apocalypse, except throw it at them. You hit the zombie with it. Like just like yeah. the computer, you hit the zombie with the computer too. <laughs> right. Uh, but you know, gold is tried and true and, you know, who's going to be mining for crypto if, you know, there's nuclear bombs or zombies or whatever the heck you want to envision. Um, so I don't, it just, it just seems silly. Like wh when is enough going to be enough? I mean, I think for, well, it looks like for 51 or half the people here, 53% of the people, uh, enough is enough. Like, come on, man. So I, the, and I've said this before, like the only real use for crypto now is, is web three applications, uh, where as it's basically a tech stock, it's crypto is not a currency. Like it's, it's just not. I think your dog is the sense and the zombies are coming. You might want to get that shotgun ready. Maybe grab a gold bar to throw at the zombies. Here <laughs> while we get, we get the next one going here, but listeners, you never thought you should weigh your assets quite literally in terms of which will be the best, most useful in the zombie apocalypse. What can you throw and hit the zombies with? <laughs> At the end of the day, since we're talking zombies and just uh, destruction, end of the world stuff, our actual question of the week last week was everyone has contagion risk on the brain after the meltdowns of all the names, you know, First Republic and Silicon Valley, all that fun. So we thought we'd put the question to you folks. Is this just a canary in the coal mine of worse systemic problems ahead or is this just a tempest in the teapot? And Dan, another one where our audience was pretty evenly split, 51% saying this is a canary in the coal mine of worse yet to come, 49% saying this is the tempest in the teapot this is going to blow over. So this oh. is strange. Usually our audience is one way or the other. They're not this evenly split on these issues. So that, that's kind of surprising in and of itself. What are your thoughts there, sir? Our audience uh, can't make up its mind on this one either. Well, one of those groups is right. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it, it, it's a tough one, man. It is a tough one. I I have been, you know... Most of what I do here with Market Taker is uh, training, teaching how options work and such, uh, and then giving trade ideas, helping you, you know, say, basically saving you time instead of flipping through a million charts, having stuff, and, and instead have stuff pop up on your screen. But every now and then, I try not to do this often, but every now and then I give some guidance. And my guidance to our student traders over the past couple of weeks has been, 
I like to be optimistic. That's who I am. I'm, I'm an optimistic sort of guy, but look for hedging opportunities. Um, it's a little, you know, there's a lot of things to be worried about out there. So, uh -oh. yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't say the worst is yet to come. I wouldn't go that far. It could blow over and I hope it blows over, but you know, there's, there's reason, like I can see possible permutations that are very realistic, uh, where the worst ends up, where the worst does come. So, you know, I, I just think it's, it's important to be a little more cautious right now and look for some inexpensive hedging opportunities when they present themselves. Um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned than optimistic. That's interesting because you've always been one of our more optimistic uh, contributors of late out there. So the fact that you're turning to the dark side, sir, <laughs> as I said at the top of the show, is interesting in and of itself. Interesting to our live chat, too. We got Nichols saying the exact same thing. Nichols saying, uh, Dan is turning to the dark side. Well, he's always been on the dark side, hence the black-hatted one. But yeah, interesting. Maybe his outlook a little bit different. Option God also chiming on the live chat saying, hey, it's cool. There's two shows this week. Yes. If you're in the live, if you're in the pro, you guys get two options boot camps in your ear holes this week. So enjoy all that fun. Speaking of enjoying, Dan, we enjoy getting the pulse of our audience. So our actual question of the week this week is really inspired by this show. Remember last week we were talking about ratio put spreads versus short puts, Dan? We thought we'd put that out to our audience this week. Very simple one. We said, what's your favorite option strategy to leg into stock positions at lower prices? Gave you the old ratio, one by two put spread. Gave you the old straight up plain vanilla short put or other. And Dan, what is your vote really first off? And then B, what do you think is winning our poll? What's our audience going for? About the, the ratio put spreads? Oh, man. Yeah, uh, this I would not. And specifically, to be clear, we're talking about buying a put and then selling two lower yes, strike long puts. one, short two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think right now is a very good time for that. Um, you know, when the market, yeah, I don't think, I, I, I don't like it right now. I just think that there's too much that could potentially go wrong and creating a disproportionate downside risk to me doesn't make sense. So you're opting for the short put or are you going for other? Oh, 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 no, 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 no. So, I mean, uh, other, uh, other, I mean, if you're going to, yeah, something something much more conservative. Um, I don't know, one to one uh, put spread. You know, one to one. Um, yeah, I I I I don't like being naked units unless it's one of those opportunities where hey, I know that long term I want to own this stock and it's really cheap. And and then I'm good with the real cash secured put intending to get assigned. Um, but no, like as a trader, just speculating, being uh, naked short units. No, I don't like it. I don't like it. You're looking a little, uh, little skittish to the dark side out there. I like it. Interesting, interesting stuff. No net short units to the dark side for Dan this week out there. Our audience taking a different tack. They're going the short put, Dan, 48.3% right now. 37.9% uh, going the ratio one by two put spread 13.8% saying other by the way if you're going to choose other we like to hear what your other is is it a straight up one by one put spread like Dan was talking about is it something else put it in the comments in the DMs let us know what you're thinking just like gambler did gambler said short ratio put spread seems reasonable however in all caps this is 2023 the era of zero day options and failing banks fortunes are made and lost in five minutes Therefore, my vote is an at-the-money short put spread where you hope for a huge down move and leg out of the long put with perfect timing. Oh, okay. You know what? Since, since Gambler chimed in on our poll, Dan, uh, let's go out to him because he also had a follow-up. As you will recall, Dan, he wrote in a couple of weeks ago with this epic short put spread on SVIX. You remember that? And he wanted to leg out of it. He wanted to use it to lower his cost basis. And we kind of said it doesn't really work like that. You remember that? I do now. Yeah, yeah. All right. So it was kind of an epic treatise, listeners. He sold, I believe it was the 1817 put spread and SFIX. SFIX, of course, the inverse volatility product. He said he'd be happy if it went out above 17 half. And he was talking about how that can use that to lower your cost basis. But we said at the end of the day, you're selling a $1 put spread for less than $1. If it goes out at the max value of $1, 
you are going to lose money unless you do what we said before, unless you kind of leg out of it. So in that case, you take the short put off early and you hope and you pray that the stock continues to plummet, in which case that long put makes up for your losses. In that scenario, you could potentially make money, but we don't recommend that. That's kind of a a bit of a complete gamble, which I guess goes with your handle of gambler because he chimed in with some follow-up on that, Dad. He said, in reference to my SVIX trade from Options Bootcamp, he says, the long put of my 1718 short put spread picked up intrinsic value with this spike in vol, and I closed out the long put to get assigned on the short put. Net result is a cost basis of $13.95 a share. Not sure I'd do it again, but I'm comfortable with, with where things landed this time. So I guess, Dan, he says it worked out. It's only a $1 wide put spread. I'm not, I'm not sure how a spike in vol benefited him that much. Mm-hmm. It, it would raise both of them, you would think. But uh, this, again, like his handle is gambler. He clearly is comfortable gambling by legging in and out of the spread. And that's what he did here. He, he legged out of it. It sounds like it worked out. But, Dan, this is not, a, not something I would go to the well with all the time. Yeah, yeah. And and it sounds like maybe he appreciates that. Uh he or she uh appreciates that. Um saying uh you know, lucked out wouldn't do this all the time or whatever. Um and 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 that's okay, you know. Uh that that's okay if you if you know that uh, going in, right? Um I mean, don't get me wrong, man. Like all my trades, I set them up for edge uh because that's that's how you do it. But I have certainly gotten lucky on trades before, right? And and I'll take that luck. Uh, I'll take that luck gladly because sometimes you get bad luck too. You know, there's variance involved um, when it comes to trading. Uh, you trade for edge and the edge ends up being your profit. Uh, but it's never going to be quite that clean. You're going to make more Sometimes you're going to lose more. Sometimes you're going to have good luck. Sometimes bad luck. Sometimes as long as you know that going in and appreciate that going in, um, that's, you know, that's great. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep, keep striving to trade smart, mathematically edge based systems and, eh, you know, Hey, take the luck when you get it. Yeah. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart, right? Indeed. And this person's handle is gambler and they're, their Twitter icon is just a big sign that says margin call, Dan. So oh, God. <laughs> I'm guessing I'm guessing they like to play a little bit close to the fire out there. But I'm glad it worked out for you, Gambler. Like, like we said, it wouldn't be my chosen way to go. But if once in a while, if you do it and you leg out of it and it works out, hey, thank the trading gods and keep rolling on. Uh, Dan, we got an onslaught of questions over the last week and change along these lines. I just kind of bumped a couple up to the surface here. But this is kind of indicative of where we are in the current market environment right now. First off, let's go to this question from Gar. These kind of questions are always scary because you know things are not exactly great in the market when we're getting questions like this. But Gar wants to know, with all the insanity reminiscent of 2008, what's an investor to do when he puts in parentheses taxable IRA, et cetera, with account balances greater than half a million dollars? Is one bank more secure than another? Should I divide up the account into multiple brokers or banks? Thanks. Uh, Mr. Dan, uh, yeah, these questions are coming fast and furious. You're probably getting these now in MTM as well. Again, not a good sign for the market, not a good sign for the economy that we're getting these. But what do you have to say for Gar? He's probably in the boat that a lot of our listeners are in. They've accumulated some cash, and now they're concerned that the bank's going to go belly up, sir. Yeah, and so when it comes to banks and the FDIC, what they're ins- what the banks, what the FDIC insurers are deposits into the bank and, you know, talk to your, I'm not an expert on this. Talk to your bank about what those limits are. It's like 200 grand, but then if you have other accounts, blah, blah, blah. But if, if you have a brokerage account, you know, that maybe happens to have an arm, that's a bank. That's not what matters. As far as brokerage, that insurance comes from SIPC, S-I-P-C. And so talk to your broker about, how much of your portfolio is insured um, and is it insured by SIPC? You know, uh, I'm not sh- I, I, I don't think it necessarily has to be. I think all the big ones are. So it's pretty important to get those distinctions um, because I'll tell you what, the devil is in the details. You get 
you know, you, you gloss over one of those details and some of the bad happens and you could be super unpleasantly surprised. Yes, uh, everyone confuses CIPIC and FDIC. CIPIC is, of course, Securities Investor Protection Corporation, kind of effectively an industry protection they put in place out there. As you point out, it is half a million the limit, but caveat, only half of that, 250000 limit for cash. If you have half a million worth of cash in your brokerage account, that's not covered. Only a quarter of a million of that is covered. A total position is half a million. It sounds like you have more than that, Gar. So if you are not comfortable, at the end of the day, Sleeping at night is not overrated. We just had the Viceroy, like I said, on our pro Q&A this week, and he's pretty familiar with the brokerage space. He said he thought he was hearing that there might be some talk about raising those SIPC limits. So that might be worth contacting your broker about and asking them, hey, this is something I'm concerned about. Have you heard anything along these lines of raising, let's say you have 650 in your account, so you're just over the limit. Maybe they're going to raise it to 750, in which case you're going to be covered if you just get a little bit patient. Uh, so that might be worth contacting your broker. But if you are substantially over that limit, it might be worth, if, if again, if this is a concern to you, and it sounds like it is, you're writing into us, then it might be worth spreading out some of your assets there. Just, again, sleeping at night, it's, it's, it's an underrated thing. At the end of the day, you want to be able to do it. You have all sorts of other risks inherent in your positions already. You don't need the additional one of waking up saying, is my money even going to be there? When I wake up in the morning. So if that's a big concern to you, contact your broker, ask them about the levels of SIPC coverage for your account. Ask them about if they know any upgrades or increases that are coming down the road. And if they say no, it might be worth spreading things out a little bit. Along those lines, Dan, let's, let's get out of here on a happier note. This comes from Jeff Davis. Uh, similar, though, going back to the bank collapses. Jeff wants to know, what would happen if you were long puts on Silicon Valley Bank right before they went from around 267 to zero and vanished. Theoretically, you should have made a fortune, but puts are the right, but not the obligation to sell the underlying at a given price. Now there's nothing to sell. In other words, how are puts exercised or closed when the underlying has disappeared? Thanks, Jeff. Well, Dan, I mentioned the scenario he lays out is kind of a grim one, but it's a positive one because Jeff should be quite happy, should he not? He's got puts on Silicon Valley, Dan. Tell him why he should have a smiley face. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the lower the stock price goes, the better. And, you know, here's one thing that I do want to point out pretty quick here is that we never want to hold trades until expiration. I mean, if you had puts from the 267 level, um, you know, I'd be out of those by the time it got to a couple of bucks. Um, you know, I mean, you've took it, you've taken, what is that, a thousand? I mean, you've taken a massive profit at that point. I mean, just massive profit. So um, you should probably never even have to ask this question. Uh, <laughs> get out while the getting's good. But um, yeah, you should be, you're, you're in pretty good shape, I think, Jeff. Yeah, you bought that contract. So you're right. It is the right, but not the obligation. But the other person on the other side of that, they have the obligation to stand in there and take that. <laughs> so that's the nice thing. That's why puts are so expensive. At the end of the day, you have them in your back pocket for a rainy day like this. So yes, you bought that. That gives you the right at any time during the lifespan of that option. Unless, like you said, the underlying goes away, in which case there will be a settlement price that OCC puts out for you. And I looked up, there is a circular right now. You can go find it on the Options Clearing Court website that deals with the nuances of SVB and the SIBB, the ticker, that dates from March 10th. But you have that contract. And as long as, as that contract exists, you can sell it or you can exercise it. And so... That is your option here. Dan is correct. I wouldn't wait until the very last minute to get the last penny or two out of it. I would sell it, take all that money, be a very happy camper, and live to fight another day, preferably on your own private island. And again, I I'm sorry to get all these questions coming in that are kind of dire, but that kind of shows what's going on in the market. So if you're a little bit concerned, if you're a little bit worried, hit us up. We're here for you folks out here at the end of the day. This show is all about you folks at the end of the day. It's not just about throwing gold at the zombies in the pockets, even though that is quite fun as well. And Mr. Dan, if they want to discuss with you the best weapons to bring into a zombie apocalypse, where should they go? What should they do? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I've got a whole um, PDF on this, um, but <laughs> you can make your way on over to markettaker.com. And, um, you know, you can join free and they'll give you access uh, to our chat room, which is temporarily free uh, for now. And there's really great resources, but that's the best way to reach me. And I'm glad to help you any way I can. I've always been a big shotgun guy. I'll take a nice uh, broadsword, too, for chopping the heads off. A flamethrower wouldn't be bad either. How about all three of those? How about that? Then you're, then you're pretty much set. What do you think? I mean, I'm sort of a, a polearm sort of guy. Polearm. <laughs> you're going straight <laughs> medieval. I love it. <laughs> I'll take a catapult, please, and a trebuchet. <laughs> a polearm. All right. Dan's got his polearm. I've got my shotgun and other assorted accoutrement. What are you bringing? into the zombie apocalypse outside of obviously your gold and hard assets to protect your investments. All right. Hope you had fun out there. Hopefully things are not too dire. If you are worried about your accounts, again, contact your brokers, contact OCC for specific questions about what they're going to do with particular tickers. That's always our first recommendation for a go-to. If you have a question about what's going to happen as a result of a particular corporate action, the Options Clearing Corp is the place to go. Just type in OCC in the ticker symbol, and it'll come up. <laughs> it'll go right to the circular, and you'll have all the answers there. So that's always your first stop to go. And then, of course, hit us up. We're here for you. That will do it for us on the live today. Back again tomorrow. I'm going to be beaming at you live, I do believe, for the option block from the SIBO HQ right down the street here. So that should be fun with the Flow Master, Mr. Henry Schwartz, and a bunch of others. And after that... For this week in Futures Options, back again on Friday for Volatility Views and, of course, for all you pro cats out there with Options Oddities. Then back again next week all the way through to another Education Wednesday, another episode of Options Bootcamp. Stay safe out there, everybody. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.